So next speaker, I would like to introduce uh, Ms. Kirsty Bremlow. Uh, she is the chair of the Human Rights Committee of the UK Bar Council. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, bonsoir, good afternoon. It's a very heavy topic to uh, speak on. Uh, however, it, it is one uh, which isn't in the past, as already been said. It's very much in the present. Um, so it's not in the past, it's, it's very much in the present. I, I actually have two hats. I um, am a QC in London and I practice in uh, international human rights law. So I'm one of the people who's actually in court uh, doing the cases as well as criminal law and public law. Uh, and also I'm uh, chair of the Bar Human Rights Committee, uh, and that consists of barristers who work uh, pro bono um, around the world, usually where we're invited in by other lawyers um, to assist with uh, issues over breaches of rule of law, uh, particularly human rights violations. And um, those of you who are on, on the media, on Twitter, the, there was a letter of ours um, in relation to Egypt's freezing of assets of NGOs, uh, and that went out today. Um, uh, many other countries, such as uh, Bangladesh, Turkey, um, have uh, very current issues. And uh, currently, uh, we're also working um, with uh, Vanessa Redgrave and others over the refugee uh, crisis. And in particular, we've done a report on Calais um, as to what is going on there, uh, focusing particularly on the plight of children. Um, I could go on, but to Iran, uh, the organization that I'm chair of has had a long history of working alongside uh, human rights defenders uh, who uh, work uh, in Iran. Uh, and from the legal perspective, uh, it is uh, a very uh, important time uh, for us. We're at our own point in history uh, where we can make definite changes. Uh, why make the changes? Well, it's already been referred to, uh, is if we don't, uh, then what history shows is that what has happened in the past just continues to happen in the future. Now, uh, I'm going to go very quickly through uh, some of the issues which are already very strongly evidenced. Uh, in Iran in uh, the summer of 1988. So we have uh, a crime there which is a crime against humanity. Uh, there's no doubt uh, there's a crime against humanity. Uh, there's plenty of evidence. Uh, we also have um, evidence which could classify this as genocide. Uh, and that is uh, the targeting uh, of a particular group uh, with an intention, uh, you don't need to actually target the entire uh, group itself, but the intention is that you are taking out um, those that have um, certain uh, religious followings or ethnicity, uh, nationality, and so on. And in this case, the figures of the killings in 1988 are put as high as 33,700, could be higher because mass graves are still being uncovered. So uh, a very, very large group consistent with a wiping out of a political idea and wiping out of a particular religious uh, uh, ethos as well. So it could be classified as genocide. The trials, uh, Ingrid has referred to this, there were no trials. There were two to three minutes uh, of hearings, which were interrogations in front of a so-called amnesty commission or committee. Uh, the people who experienced them or knew of them called them the death committee or commission. Because what they were, were they were interrogations, uh, sometimes maybe five questions if you were lucky, uh, but usually just the one question, which was to establish where your past loyalty was or had been. And uh, if the answer um, was uh, one which was the Mohedin, then uh, that was your death sentence. Uh, if the answer was perhaps not even 
uh, supportive enough of what was felt to be the current regime uh, than the death sentence. So it wasn't a sentence, it was an extrajudicial killing because there was no judicial process. As well, those had already been tried, again under an unfair process, who were serving sentences, were swept up and killed. Those who'd been released and actually had served their time were swept up and killed. So there could be no cloak of any due process here. So there is no doubt there, in terms of breaches of international law, they are numerous. You then have the mass graves, what happens to the bodies, the families not being informed, the suffering that occurs, the lack of dignity, uh, and Ingrid has referred to that very graphically, the dignity of the human being, which actually is the fundamental of our international law, that was completely trampled upon uh, and torn up uh, by what happened in Iran in 1988 and is still happening today and we saw that the reference to the recent uh, executions at the beginning of August of this year. Iran now boasts of having uh, in the uh, period um, uh, that we're concerned with, uh, it has a, a real spike in uh, executions uh, in recent times, in fact, in, in, in the modern times, there's been more executions uh, in Iran under the, um, this, this particular period than any time in Iran's history. So, the hangings themselves. Now, as to what happened with the hangings themselves, I, I'm going to read from what was discovered many years ago, uh, and um, it, nothing to contradict it, very briefly. Uh, this was smuggled out from somebody who worked at, Elvin, at Evin uh, Prison, one of the uh, perhaps most notorious prisons. He said they would line up prisoners by a 14 by 5 meter hall in the central office building and then ask simply one question, what is your political affiliation? Those who said Mohadeen would be hanged from cranes in position in the car park behind the building. The testimony went on to describe how every half hour from 7.30 in the morning until 5 p.m., 33 people were lifted on three forklift trucks to six cranes, each of which had five or six ropes. He said the process went on without interruption. It had to be a conveyor belt in order to be able to execute, to mass murder that number of people. And it was thought that in around uh, two weeks, about 8,000 were killed in that way, with similar carnage being reflected around the country. The audio tape, um, bring it to the present, the audio tape uh, which was put up on the internet uh, has produced new evidence, and it's very important. So that tape, that recording, <coughs> is of uh, the meeting which is very important, where we have a number of those who are still not only in political office, but in judicial office uh, now. And um, that recording is from the 9th, um, uh, sorry, the 15th of August, uh, 1998, and it was released on the 9th of August, 2016. And it, it includes this. Um, uh, from Montezeri. He said, 15-year-old girls and pregnant women were amongst those killed. In Shia uh, jurisprudence, even if a woman is Moharab, waging war on God, she shouldn't be executed. If Khamenei, I, I, sorry, I told Khamenei this, but he said, no, execute the women too. So, very strong evidence there that the executions were carrying on of children, and there was evidence before that of uh, children, 13-year-olds, being hanged. Children, pregnant women, um, they were all being uh, brutally dispatched with. So 
the crimes against humanity have already been recognised and uh, the Canadian Parliament as well in 2013 unanimously passed a motion uh, recognising this was a crime against humanity and you've had reference to the Amnesty Report, Human Rights Watch, which were back in uh, 2005 and 2007. So the position now is why have an organization uh, trying to, to get more evidence? Isn't there enough? Um, no, there hasn't been in the past. Secondly, um, there is a, there's been a gathering uh, of evidence which has been smuggled out by very brave people, um, which has built. We also have the audio recording, which is extremely significant. One very important point is when you're dealing with terror, which undoubtedly this period was, we tend to consider terrorism in this time that we're in now as um, something from within the civilian uh, population, the, the religious fanaticism, the bloodthirsty sex, the groupings, the extremists. Uh, and that is terrorism. Uh, it's committed spreading terror. And part of terrorism is it has its own ideology. What we find now is the ideology is usually packed with religious ideals because that is going to appeal to a wider grouping. But that is bottom-up terrorism. You also have top-down terrorism, and top-down terrorism is state terrorism. So that is carried out by the states, and we have many examples of that in history, um, thinking of, of, of Russia um, to, to name but one in terms of governing through terror. Here we have terror uh, being inflicted by a state. Uh, and being inflicted in such a way where it's carried on to the actual specific uh, murders um, building up the crimes. We're in a good position because we know who the state is. This isn't a faceless um, organization. Uh, this is a state that comes to the UN and sits around the table. Uh, th this is a state which has representatives. This is a state that uh, we uh, do business with. Uh, and so also the, form, the formula um, of the UN and the reason behind the UN being set up was uh, in order to prevent states murdering their own people, such as happened in, the, in World War II. So I think we really need to go back to that Universal Declaration, 1948. What was the point of the UN? It was to say that we can never again have states massacring its own citizens and that this has to stop. So here we have evidence of a state massacring its own citizens. Uh, so here the next step for the UN is to have an investigation into it. Different investigations can happen even without the cooperation Percy. of a country. Thanks. Um, I'm just going to finish on, on the final point um, uh, in terms of the investigation. What I would say is we're very caught up with being in the centre of our own historical wrong with the refugee crisis and those drowning off the coast of Europe. However, uh, we should not consider that what happened in Iran is in the past, it's in the present, and we should make steps, all of us, um, to bring the perpetrators to justice. Thank you.